What we want to do is today is to facilitate an experience um, with all of us to increase our understanding of restorative practices um, while demonstrating how these practices can be um, promoted to improve school climate by strengthening people's sense of value. Um, and, um, and, and really, you know, just people's importance in the school community. So um, we want to increase your understanding how these practices can be helpful also just to build positive relationships between students and staff, staff to staff and with parents. Um, many, many of our colleagues that have gone through this have reported to us that they have actually are using this in their home as well with their children, with their spouse, with their families. Um, and it's something I've done for quite some time. And we have these uh, photos up here as a way to also remind us, like if you can look at nature and nature can teach us such amazing lessons. If we just take a moment to, to, to be humble and to, to realize as we look at these penguins, we can learn from them. Look how they've developed a way to huddle together because they live in such a harsh environment. They come together and they know that they actually depend on each other for their very survival and they work as a team you know some sometimes they're in the middle enjoying the warmth and other times they're going to the outside and taking the brunt of the cold for the community and they go in and out and in and out and it's a way that they can thrive in in such a harsh community and when we look at the redwoods you know i'm, I'm sure many of you already know this, but um, the redwoods actually reach out their root system to each other, to their neighbors, and they intertwine their uh, root system as a way to communicate, as a way to, to heal each other in times of need, but also as a really important way to stabilize each other in their foundation, in who they are, so that when the strong winds come, they're not easily knocked down. Um, it takes a really, really um, event, like a climate event in some ways to, to, to knock those trees down because they're so intertwined in their community. And we say, that's what we need, right? We need our young people, we need our adults to begin to intertwine in their relationships and recognize that we are alike, that we need each other. Um, and there's such a strength in community. Um, but we know that we live in a society that is very, very, you know, individualistic and very kind of like in some ways can, can lean towards selfishness. And we just say, well, we need to listen to our ancient wisdom of our ancestors because um, we've lost some of that. And so we say that the restorative practices actually is built on ancient wisdom, the indigenous wisdom from around the world. So it's, you know, obviously Native Americans here, but, but I mean, indigenous communities from Africa, from Asia, from, from Europe, from the Americas, from, you know, just First Nations. It's like that people have been sitting in circle for generations for centuries they understood that relationships are so important right and if if you really think of it all of us even though you may not think of yourself as coming from indigenous community at some point all of our ancestors sat in circle right they 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 met in circle whether it was sitting around a fire or some, somewhere to be able to work in it as a family, as a community. That was the only way that they were going to be able to survive and thrive in a, in a very challenging environment. And so we know that we come from uh, wise ancestors who understood these things. For some reason, over these past years, we've forgotten much of that. So we say we want to restore it. <laughs> you know, it's in our DNA. We want to restore that. And, and, and we want to kind of, I guess, learn from 
Uh, for example, the Mayan culture has this greeting um, with each other that they would say to each other in Lakesh. So if I saw you, for example, you know, I, in, the, in the community, I say, hey, in Lakesh. And you might say, Halakim. And it's, it's a way of me saying, you are the other me. And then you're answering, yeah, I'm the other you. And it's, it's really a, a way that their society has developed a way to remind each other. We're connected, right? I know we're separate beings, right? But we still are connected in our community. We're, we're human beings and we have that human connection that honestly, I would say in this culture, many of us have lost. We're trying to restore, right? Ancient wisdom where, where we will value every member of our community. So every, if you're working at a school, that every member of your community, both colleagues, you know, and, and students and parents would feel that they're always valued when, they're, when they come to your community, your school community, um, that they know that they're important and they have a high level of human dignity. Why is that? Because we choose to show that. We have very mindful, intentional adults who are committed to making sure that the culture of that school is flooded with that, this, this um, giving human dignity in, in every communication, both verbal and nonverbal, right? That's, it's really important. But we also understand it is important to be accountable to each other. So if I do something that's harmful, that I'm going to hold myself accountable and the community will, will hold me accountable, but they will do it also with that chance for forgiveness and for reintegrating in good relationship in the community. So it's not just, hey, I punish you and hope that you learn your lesson. It's no, we're gonna help you learn your lesson. We're gonna help you learn how important you are and how, how connected you are in relationship so that you would never harm people that you truly believe that you are the other, you're like their, their, their partner, they're like almost family. And so that's why we say that restorative practices really moves from oppression to empowerment. And that oppression, at least in our society, it, so much of it is based in colonialism, right? Of ownership and even ownership of people when we saw how, how the slaves were treated. I mean, what a what an inhumane thing, right? To go to Africa and rip people from their families, force them onto slave ships where many would die on the on the trip. And then and then when they got to you know to the United States, it's like now you're enslaved and you have to work for the in these plantations and this horrendous life. Um, but you also saw it the way the way native communities were treated by the by the colonists, right? By just, I mean, there's like an attitude um, that that was so oppressive that we have remnants of now, and we're saying we want to move away from that colonialism and and now work towards empowerment where people restore their human dignity. Um, yeah, it's really important part of this restorative work. So we're going to go a, a bit into, I'm going to ask some of you to kind of start to participate a little bit and, um, and just, you know, it's, it's a way to just ask people to start to engage. So Melinda, can you hear me? Would, would you be willing to read this out loud for us? And we'll just kind of follow along with you. Take your time as you read, read it and just see it. Melinda, as you're reading it, see if there's something that resonates as a part of it. Just, is there something that resonates with you? Sure. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Defining restorative practices. Restorative practices are based on principles that emphasize the importance of positive relationships mm -hmm. as central to building community. They promote values and principles that use inclusive collaborative approaches. When broadly and consistently implemented, they promote and strengthen positive transformational school culture. 
Restorative practices also involve processes that repair relationships when harm has occurred. Accountability is achieved through understanding impact, repairing harm, and restoration. Thank you, Melinda. Now, Melinda, was, is there a word or a phrase or something that resonates a little bit more deeply with you in this um, I think that the word inclusive is very important as well as values for me. Good. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. And Erica, what about you? What's, what's, is there something that you see that kind of resonates a little bit more with you? Um, well, the transformational school culture, because I was in a, another meeting this morning and it was all about like how we're coming back and how, you know, we need to be doing things differently because the old way didn't work. Uh, and so in restorative practices is part of having a whole different mindset and culture to to a school and welcoming, welcoming people back from a pandemic and, and such. That's powerful, Erica. Thank you for that. And Pedro, what about you? Um, is there any any part of this that you feel kind of resonates a bit more with you? Um, for me, it was uh, also a little bit of that transformational school culture. Uh, we're coming back and, um, you know, uh, things have changed. And I think sometimes, you know, when we go back to a setting, um, we have to be mindful and remind students that um, they're they're here on, on, on site. And so we need to um, get everybody up to speed and be mindful of, of the new, you know, whatever's going out there and you just kind of be cautious and, and, and take care of yourself. Wow, that's really well put. And thank you both uh, for bringing up that thing of, you know, we're coming back, but after a pandemic, right? So it's, there's a lot for us to really be mindful of and, 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 and why go back to kind of the way things were when not everything was working well. It's a chance to reform and to transform. So I really appreciate those, um, those comments. And um, Joshua, for yourself, um, is there anything in this definition that kind of resonates a little bit more for you? Building community and promoting values and principles. I think that as providers, that's like our highest responsibility, we tend to come in contact with a lot of students who don't have positive values or principles. Um, and it's kind of up to us to build that type of community in the environments we're creating. That's fantastic. Thank you, Joshua. I appreciate that. And Linda, what about you? Is there anything that resonates with you on this? For me, it was the consistently implemented because any of us can say well you know we're going to make a change but to hold ourselves accountable is something different and so ensuring that you're doing things with intention and you know that you're going to have that consistent basis or else it's not gonna it's not gonna happen the way you would like it to all right linda that was excellent thank you and, and like i really like that idea of it it really needs to be consistent it needs to be, you use the word intentional, and, and you might even think of it needs to also be strategic. So, so all of those, you know, need to be happening. And so I always try to you know, mention to people, you know, whether you're a teacher or not a teacher, you're always teaching. Um, whether you like it or not, people are watching you. They're learning from you. They're learning from you. even your facial expressions. If you frown at them, they're learning like, oh, you're not, you know, you're mad or you're not safe. You know, they're interpreting in their minds. Are you a person that's safe to approach or not? So we're constantly teaching by the way we respond, the way we listen, our, you know, the, the way we look at people. And so um, what we say is, maybe we should be more intentional and strategic about the way we teach because we're teaching all the time. So let's, let's, let's teach what we want to teach, right? Let's teach um, how to care for each other better, how to make people feel more valued as a human being, um, make them feel a, more of a sense of belonging. And, and, and I would say we're kind of working to try to restore hope in public education, right? 
but everything that we do is kind of trying to restore that. So um, thank you everybody for um, doing that so well. So I wanted to kind of also just show this video. Some of you probably have seen it, but I want to kind of show it for those who haven't seen it yet. And it basically, I think, gives a good picture of what would it be like, you know, like if you're in a school where they're not really intentional, they're not being strategic and, and they're not focused, they're not being mindful about this. What does that look like? And then what does it look like when a school is intentional? and they are making every effort to communicate those messages. Hey, Mr. Q. Did you see that? Why would somebody do that? Please go into the classroom, no talking, quietly. Hey, Ms. Merida, how you doing? We need you inside. How do you think that makes us feel? I forgot my number. What's your name? Jordan, what's your last name? Carter. All right, go ahead. School is hard enough. Come on in, sit down quietly at your desks and begin writing. This kind of stuff just makes it harder. I said quietly, please. Who's talking? Is it you, Sophie? Don't let it be you. Don't believe me? Sophie. Please just watch. I'm not up here for me, I'm up here for you. Pay attention, okay? Now, somebody answer me. Somebody needs to answer me really fast. Every time we're ignored or yelled at or silent, the the teacher takes away what's possible. No horseplay, no running, and especially no talking. Moment Kids by moment. Ms. Garrity, your students' behavior yesterday in the lunchroom, it was terrible. Next time, silent lunch. Did you hear that? Stay in line and catch a bubble. I'm not playing. If this is education, we're in trouble. Bye, Miss McGarrity. Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. The way it is now, two of the three of us will never be able to really read. It doesn't have to be this way. Hey, Jordan, how you doing? Good. Good. Everyone we meet throughout our day can make a difference. I've been waiting for you to arrive. All the difference. Good, how are you? Good, how are you? Hi. Hi, Jordan. Bye, Jason. Good morning, Jordan. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. How are you? Good. Go ahead and put your number in. Talk with well, us, I don't know my not at us. That's OK. I'll look it up for you. Go ahead, sweetheart. OK. All right. Have a Teach good us day. what we need to know. Good. That's how we get smarter. Well, good morning, Sophie, Janicia, and Jordan. And when you talk with us and teach us, give us bigger and bigger words. Now what I'd like you to do, children, is turn around and converse with your neighbor and discuss where the mother might have gone. Words that we can use to read and understand. She is prey for eagles, so she hunts at night. And that will take us places we can never reach without you. Remember, we're entering the learning zone. Now, how can we show our respect to the children and teachers who are working? We can walk quietly. Yes. OK, kids, so what I'd like you to do is continue writing your narrative, documenting your emotions, if you were the baby owl and your mother abandoned you in the nest. What can you do? Learn all that you can so, you you so that you can challenge us to be our best. You would have stayed and assisted them in whatever they needed. Share yourself with us and show us how to share ourselves with others. Give us courage. Give us compassion. Help us find our own voices so we can become who we are meant to be. I, it's really, you know, we just wanted you to kind of like reflect on that about like, you know, the teaching is happening all the time and the hope is that you know, that, that we actually can get the whole school to buy into this, the, the bus driver, the, you know, the cafeteria worker, the teacher, the administrator, that if everybody is giving this message all the time, we're going to have a, a, a school full of students that they have no doubt that they are cared for there, that this is a place of, of human beings who truly do you know, care for them and that they're wanted at the school.
makes a, a big difference. And so one thing that we um, just feel is important to cover as a part of this restorative justice practices is the school to prison pipeline and what that means. Um, that, you know, the basic idea is that um, for many years, our school system used punishment as its primary tool to change behavior, to manage behavior, thinking that, okay, if we come down kind of with a stronger punishment of somebody that was um, misbehaving or whatever, that, that would, they'll step back in line, right? They'll, they'll start to manage their behavior better. What we found though, through, um, I guess, through the data over, over a number of years is that um, there, were, there were a number of kids who know that it didn't work for them. It actually was the opposite. It actually made them feel um, less connected uh, with the school. Like here, we're wanting to reconnect them to the school and actually we're doing the exact opposite. They're feeling pushed out. They're feeling unwanted, um, not important, right? Not connected. And so what ends up happening is those students tend to not care as much. They're not attending well. They're not engaging in the classes. And pretty soon now they really become a behavior problem. And, uh, and so what, what schools did, though, was they just punished them harder, right? Suspension, expulsion. And, um, and, and then we, we really found that certain groups of students um, were pushed out much more, just even nationally, when we looked at the data, we were like, wow, look at how many kids had experienced this, um, like an overwhelming use of punishment upon them, right? Um, and so it was like a disproportionate amount of, of, of that isolation um, and so, um, and we found it to be, it, a lot of times it went down the racial lines for African-American students were, were uh, way more uh, kind of the victims of that. And, and some other groups as well, including um, students with disabilities and, 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 and sometimes Latino students and others. But I, we wanted you just to be aware of that because what we're talking about is like, it's almost reversing the harm that's been done. That's an injustice. So now we're saying, how do we do restorative justice practices, right? To, 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 to intentionally move this work so that, that especially those who have been so um, uh, demeaned and devalued by a system of injustice, how can we now help to restore their sense of belonging, their sense of being wanted and cared for. Um, but we understand that that takes extra work. It's, it's, we have to go above and beyond. Um, just like we would do for a student with special needs, we say, oh, we have to provide these special accommodations, a bit more extra support. Well, we say a lot of these students that even just coming from a family uh, from a, like where there's been generational harm within the school system and with, within society, they need additional support to be able to regain trust again, right? So any of you, you all know this, when you've been harmed in relationship, either a friend betrayed you or you were bullied or anything like that in life, it took a while for you to regain that trust if you ever did, right? Because it, it is such a deep scar. And so we are saying, hey, that's why we call this restorative justice practices, right? We want to, to really truly create a school that is um, truly uh, um, developing a, a system of equity where we know that certain students need additional supports and we're gonna provide that to them because that is the just thing. It's the righteous thing to do in many ways. And so when we look at this shift, this is kind of what it takes. It takes kind of like that traditional discipline kind of uh, shifting over to a restorative sort of discipline, uh, you know, where, where you're 
not just so concerned about schools and rules, the, the rules and things like that being violated. You're, you're more interested in the people and the relationship. So it's, it's really about the human beings above the, I guess, what, uh, what would be considered like the um, like rules being broken. And so one of the things I like to um, encourage people is within your school, within your organization, to try your best to always prioritize the human beings above all the other practices, all the other kind of state standards and grades and attendance and money and this and that, that the human beings should always be the top priority. And we should be um, intentional about the, the way we truly live that out. So um, one thing is that, you know, we use this social discipline window to kind of, um, I guess, describe what restorative practices is and what it's not. Um, so by the way, it's not, if you see where the for or the permissive is, if you look where that is, it's very um, strong on that support. You see the arrow on the bottom, that's the higher, the further you go to the right on this graphic, the, the, the stronger the support. Uh, but the, the, the higher you go on the graphic, the more control and discipline and limit setting, even like holding the high standard. So if you're super supportive, but you're not holding a high standard, you're, in a, you're, you're becoming permissive and you're not, um, what would I say? You're, 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 you're not actually um, helping that student grow in the way that, that, that they need to. Um, and all of us, you know, we all need to be held accountable. We all need to be responsible. And so sometimes people think, though, the permissive is the restorative, but it's not. Um, the support, yes, it is. But guess what? So is the holding the high standard. That's where the whiff is. Um, we obviously know being punitive and being just, you know, kind of um, controlling and all that. That's not and, and we know the neglectful is not, but the one that gets confusing for people is they think permissive is. And so, but this is the way I like to explain it. The restorative mindset is one of embracing people where they are, and because we can't control where they're coming from. So we, we just embrace them where they are. That's our job. That's our responsibility. And that is truly equity. If you embrace every student where they're coming from, you're, now you're being equitable, but this is also equity. Am I willing to provide them the supports that they need to be successful, right? If you're, because, you know, if I say, oh, I just embrace you where you are, but I'm not gonna provide you supports to actually improve yourself then what, what's going on? You know, I'm not really um, functioning at a high level as an educator. So what we say is we embrace people where they are and then we provide them the supports that they need. And the way we um, measure success isn't like, hey, they, they're at a 10 on a one to 10 scale. No, we say we ju judge success by a growth mindset. They grow and they, they improve. Right. And most special um, education is, you know, uh, special ed teachers and people, they understand this. It's like real growth mindset, you know, but we should have that on the social emotional as well. Right. It's growth and you celebrate the growth. You don't like get upset because they're not up here just because you want them to be. That's not a restorative mindset. Um, and, and that's, I know this is hard to swallow. So I, you know, I don't mean any disrespect on it, but I do have to challenge you in some of this. This is this paradigm of a restorative paradigm is very challenging and there's no way around it. It's hard work. I know I try to live this every day. And for myself, it's a challenge. Um, and my ego gets in the way sometimes and it's not easy for me, but I, I'm going to keep um, I'm going to keep trying. You know, I'm not, I, I know I'm not going to be attained perfection or something, but, but I'm going to keep trying. 
it's it's important to know, um, to know that all of us have different reactions to conflict, right? Um, uh, there are some of us that you know really go into avoidance, or maybe we withdraw. Um, uh, there are some of us that will go on the attack of others, um, and then some of us actually attack self. And so, uh, but I I want us to think about. I'm, I'm sure if you've been serving young people in schools or in, in community services, you, you've probably seen some of this, right? Where, where maybe you were trying to help out a student to, to see what was going on with a, a conflict that, or maybe something that they had done or something like that. And then you, you see them kind of go into this, what we call compass of shame. And the, the, Withdrawal means like, you know, when you're with us with a young person and then they kind of shut down, they're with you physically, but they're really not with you. Um, it's kind of like, you know, emotionally disconnecting um, and avoidance is a little bit similar, but it's avoidance oftentimes is like not showing up at the class or not going to your appointment, not, not showing up at school, not, you know, avoiding, but also using drugs and alcohol to avoid. Um, that's also a form of avoidance. And then, um, and then sometimes, you know, we'll see people really go on the attack of others. So they, they're, they, uh, kind of a button is pushed or a switch goes off for them. Like a, it might be something that's traumatized them in the past. And all of a sudden though, they, they, to feel a bit of control, they go on the attack rather than look at themselves. It's more comfortable to go on the attack of others. And so they might even go on attack of you. They might call you names. They might say things about your school, your organization um, that they probably don't really feel, but they're just, it's like just shooting wild. And then um, sometimes you'll hear students or young people go on this attack of self. They'll say things like, yeah, I'm so dumb. I'm so stupid. Um, you know, I'm not a good, I'm not a good person. I'm, I'm a bad guy or, you know, things like that. You'll be, and then sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll actually see that some young people will actually go into hurting themselves, like cutting. Right. Um, and then even to the point, obviously a, like an extreme point would be a, a suicidal ideation, something like that. So what we um, wanted to ask you, so it, like in order for us to become more understanding um, and more empathetic with young people, we need to look in ourselves that we all have these things. Like I know for myself, you know, I uh, sometimes I'll avoid or withdraw. There's been times that I've honestly done all of these, right? Um, I've attacked others. Um, so, but just think about you, what, what's, what's your go-to most of the time in, 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 in different relationships that you might have? Um, what do you do when there's, when conflict arises, maybe you're accused of something, maybe you're caught doing something. Um, what's your go-to on that? And then um, if, if you look at this list right here, what's the top thing? <laughs> Listen, you know, be present with them without trying to problem solve. And that's, that's what Melinda was telling us. And then Leo was telling us the last one, but Leah, I know this isn't exactly what you were saying, but it reminds me of what you were saying. Teach to talk to themselves as they would someone they love. Um, Cause when you were telling us that I was going, Oh yeah, it reminds me of that last bullet point on here. So when we say affective communication, Typically, what we're saying is that it's a way of communicating to be able to set boundaries. It provides feedback. It shows human impact and teaches empathy because what you're doing with affective communication is you are actually communicating how that behavior affected you. It, it impacted your, you know, as a, as a human being, right? And so you're not like communicating, you know, in a way that you're kind of putting people down, like you're just lazy or stop being so disruptive. You're, you're still holding people accountable, but you're doing it with, with clarity, kind of the, what, what, what you heard from Laura right now. She wants to have things clearly spelled out. So in this, on that top um, example, it says, when I heard you speaking to Marcos the way you did, 
I felt concern. You hear, did you see that? I felt concern. There's the feeling because we agreed that we value respect. And that, by the way, reverts back to those community agreements that, that Laura was talking about. And then the, the, the request comes in, would you be willing to speak more respectfully with others, right? So it doesn't have to be word for word like any of the, there's a couple of other examples, but you know, it doesn't have to be word for word, but the idea is that you, you provide an observation, a feeling, a need, and a request. And it can be, it's a more effective, effective, you know, with an E, way of communicating. And, and um, so we talked about the restorative questions within, the, within the, um, the, the continuum of restorative practices. And, you know, why are we using questions like restorative questions? And um, Laura, would you, would you be willing to read these for us where it says restorative questions? Sure thing. Um, designed to be open-ended and non-judgmental to help people reflect and express their role in harmful situations. Provides people with the opportunity to educate us what they are thinking rather than us making assumptions. The first step toward healing is to provide a safe environment where people trust that they will be heard and accepted as they are. Thank you, Laura. And then is there any part of this that resonates a little bit more deeply with you? Well, it's interesting because in my, um, the compass of shame, I go towards attacking myself. And when asked what others can do to support me, when I go to that place, it is to um, be accepted and, um, and trusted that where I am is just, is okay. It's enough. So that third point that would be, and you know, if there was any harm, just to clearly let me know, hey, this is what happened. And right now, there's not a lot you can do. Just know that this is just a moment, like Leah said, I love that. And it doesn't define you. Or this is the thing, this is what you can do um, to repair that harm. But yeah, so just being ex um, accepted. That's and beautiful. Heard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, what's cool is like, you know, oftentimes, you know, somebody does something wrong, we want to tell them first, like what the way we kind of judge them in some ways, but this is saying, wait, wait, first, just ask questions so you can learn more rather than assuming that, you know, the whole thing, right? It's like, to, to and, and if you start with questions, you're actually going to be open to learning. If you start with kind of um, attacking kind of statements, you're, you're going to shut them down and you yourself are going to go into attack mode, which is going to shut you down. And so these are some of the restorative questions, right? Um, so when you're, when your uh, questions responding to challenging behavior, you don't have to ask these exact things word for word, but this is a guide. It's like a template. Um, but many educators, and even today in the morning, I had educators telling me, yeah, I use these questions and they really help in my relationship with students. So it's what happened? What were you thinking of at the time? You know, what have you thought about since? Who has been affected by what you've done? In what way? And what do you think you need to do to make things right? So you're giving them the chance to reflect and think about even themselves, how they might be able to restore the situation. And then um, this one's to help those, who, um, you know, the, who were harmed by others. So, you know, what did you think when you realized what had happened? What impact has this incident had on you and others? Um, what has been the hardest thing for you? Um, and what do you think needs to happen to make things right? And, you know, oftentimes when somebody's harmed, like in the schools, for example, the, the, the student who did the harm is brought in and they're, they're, you know, they're punished, they're disciplined. Okay. They, and yet oftentimes the person who was harmed is never actually involved in being able to process what happened. You know, one of the greatest things that I've seen about these questions is that when, when the two students are able to be brought together and they've been asked these questions, they've been prepped and sometimes they've been, they wrote the answers out. 
And then they come together and then they read those questions, the, the answers back to the person who was harmed and the person who did the harm. And it gives them, like, for example, the, what I've seen, the people who were harmed, when they, when they hear what that person was thinking and, and what they thought about since, what, what the, the, that in itself almost seems like this restoring healing process because most of the time the people who were harmed are thinking it's going to happen again. Oh my God, you know, they hate me. They, 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 they're after me and, and stuff like that. But oftentimes it was something really different from what they were thinking. And this actually clarifies it um, for them. It's amazing in appropriate kinds of situations when you do this, it's really quite a, a, a restorative um, ex experience for everybody. There we go. So I'm gonna include in our chat, um, it's gonna be our main, uh, a link to our main San Diego County Office of Ed's uh, Restorative Practices, Restorative Justice Practices um, website. Let me do a share as well, just one moment. So our um, our current flyers for the 2021-22 school year can be found there. And while you're doing that, Robert, I did want to mention to them that you're helping us to, um, when we're done with those videos that, that uh, Laura and I and others are working on, you're helping us put those on the web page. Yes, and I'll show, I'll be able to guide where we'll be able to find those as well. But is this sharing, is this um, yes. your screen open on your end? Perfect. Uh, so just a reminder about our tiered approach to restorative practices and implementation, but all of our uh, our workshop flyers can be found on this main uh, main site. Click on here and it'll bring you to a, a PDF. So feel free to share that PDF um, with, uh, with all of your colleagues. I do wanna uh, point out that we do have an updated flyer that was a bit of a typo on one of our training dates, but all, if you have already, um, use this flyer to reg register, all the OMS links are, were correct. Uh, but if you are gonna be sharing any um, any of these flyers, so please use um, the most updated version on our website. Um, a link to our resource page can be found in the upper right. So let's see here, a quick click. And did that update on your end? Yes. yes. There we go. So you'll be finding some more additional resources here. Um, that will include our, some of our video resources, as well as some of those, um, some of our templates as well. So I know today we shared, oh, we'll talk a bit more about tomorrow with some of our um, our best circles practices, um, but that template that we use just to show all of uh, from where our participants um, came from today can be found here as well. So it's gonna be, um, if you don't bookmark it, just an SDCOE RP is gonna bring you to our, our main page. And that's where you'll find our uh, our contact info and any of our um, our most recent um, training flyers. Um, we are planning on including a couple more uh, as well um, that are in development. Uh, Anthony, if you wanna talk a little bit more about maybe the, uh, the trainer of trainers model, um, but all the, again, all that registration info is gonna be able to be found here on our main website. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, we'll, we'll be, um, you know, I, I think in, in the people that go through this, these initial trainings um, will invite you if you're interested in developing, becoming a trainer yourself, basically. So, um, yeah, this is something that we're going to, you know, I, I would say only, you know, very engaged, committed people should come to that training. Like, you know, um, you're going to need to be really engaged in that kind of a, a training. So, um, but we will have uh, those, we'll post those up and, um, and I'm looking forward to those videos that we're gonna have these different video series that we're uh, right now developing and they're exciting. They're things that we hope that you'll share with others. Um, yeah, so just kind of check in on that. Um, I, I would say, Robert, when do you think that the, the, those new videos would be on there? Um, probably before, within the next, uh, within the next week for sure. Oh, great, thank you.